Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Maltrip, Chief Executive here and a proud member. And it's June 26th. You're with a virtual City Club forum live from the studios of 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. They are our public media partner and we're deeply grateful for that partnership. The World Health Assembly has designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. And that's in celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale. This year-long recognition and celebration was announced well before the coronavirus pandemic, and it has taken on increased relevance, of course, as nurses and midwives are playing a vital role in the unprecedented public health crisis we're all facing. Today, we'll talk about the past, present, and future of the nursing profession with one of the region's most distinguished nurse educators and leaders. And before I introduce her, I want to thank our generous members, sponsors, and donors who support our virtual forums. For a full list, please visit us at cityclub.org slash thank you. And you can join them in supporting our work by making a contribution or becoming a member at cityclub.org. Now to our speaker. Dr. May Weichel is Professor Emerita at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. She's a native of Martins Ferry, Ohio, on the Ohio River, and an internationally recognized expert in fields of geriatric and mental health nursing. She was the first African-American dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University, and the chair endowed in her name in 2007 was the first such chair at Case Western Reserve University named for an African-American scholar. Throughout her 40-year career at Case Western Reserve University, she has made it her personal mission to bring more minorities into the nursing profession. And most recently, Dr. Weichel was named in the 2020 class of 8 over 80 from Crane's Cleveland Business. As in every City Club forum, you can participate with your questions. You can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. And you can also tweet them at the City Club, and we will work them in. Dr. Weichel, welcome back to the City Club of Cleveland. It's good to be here. It was 2002, the last time you spoke, so it's been a, yeah. a, a couple of decades in between. Um, this year is very special, the year of the nurse and midwife. Um, as a career nurse and nurse educator and nurse leader, what does this mean to you? Well, it means a lot because in my 60-plus years of practice, it's the first time that nursing has got such a worldwide recognition. And the... Uh, the assembly, the World Health Assembly of the uh, World Health Organization, has named that um, 2020 as the year of the nurse and midwife, and that was in honor of Florence Nightingale on her 200th birthday. So the nurses and uh, nursing schools and hospitals have come together to promote a year-long celebration and recognition of all the contributions that nurses have made to health care. Talk more about that, though. I mean, the you know. Those of us who have ever had any real encounters, I mean, and who hasn't had a real encounter with the healthcare system, right? They, it is the the nurses who are the the lifeblood of the uh, and the heart of so many uh, of so many healthcare facilities and so many healthcare procedures and and our own healthcare journeys. Why do you think they haven't gotten the this kind of recognition before? I mean, surely we weren't just waiting for two hundred years to pass since Florence, Florence Nightingale. <laughs> Well, that's a good question because I wonder that myself because nurses certainly have been the backbone of uh, health care, and, and they are the ones as leaders that bring together the whole labyrinth of, of health care workers. And so they are like the silent heroes that do not often get recognition. They get recognition from their patients, mm -hmm. but they have not gotten as much recognition uh, in the community. But we are getting better. And so I was very pleased at WHO for recognizing nurses. And this is worldwide, so that's why they added the nurses and midwives, because well, it's all over the world that they're celebrating nurses. It is. Uh, it's extraordinary that it would be this year, uh, a year in which we're facing this pandemic, which I guess early on maybe we wouldn't have called it quite unprecedented given the, the 1918 flu pandemic right. and, and so forth. But 
increasingly every day, this does feel different, more widespread, more difficult to manage. Mm-hmm. As, uh, as a lifelong nurse and thinking about the profession today and the challenges that, that your colleagues are facing right now. Um, I always say it's ironic that in the year of the nurse, that nurses have been the standout caregivers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the media really has helped shed light on their compassion and the creative role that they have to take in a chaotic health care disaster, which is what COVID-19 really is. Indeed. Can you talk about your own personal journey, uh, which I understand began when uh, right after you graduated your health, your journey as a health care professional began when you graduated high school? Yes. When I graduated from high school, I uh, really... uh, had intended to go on to college, and, and, and I was looking at becoming a, a, a physician. And I, uh, for that summer, went to look for a job as a nursing assistant at our local hospital. And I, you have to know that I grew up when bias was legal, so they did not have African Americans on their staff. And had it not been for a physician who was head of the hospital, who happened to know my grandmother because she named my grandfather, my father after him, he decided that we should be able to get a job there. And so it was it was trying times because the whole hospital decided that they would uh, strike if they brought in an African-American to work only as a nursing assistant. The whole but, hospital? Uh, the whole hospital. I didn't learn that until after I was there. <laughs> after I was there, they said, well, we, we don't think you're so bad after all. But the, the nice thing about going there and working as a nursing assistant is that's why I was sold on nursing, because I was working nights with a nurse, and she called me and said, I'm busy, and you're going to have to do alcohol sponge baths on this 85-year-old lady who had a very high temp and was very sick. And I thought, oh, that's going to be difficult, because I had to do it many times through the night. This was the old-fashioned way before Tylenol of bringing down fever. So all night long, I gave her an alcohol sponge bath, and in the morning, her temp was down. And the nurse said to me, you know what? I think you saved her life. And, you know, that was the moment that it clicked in my head that I should go into nursing. So even though they weren't taking nurses at that hospital, they suggested that I uh, call Cleveland, uh, because Cleveland Metropolitan was which was City Hospital at the time, did take in African-American nurses and or Akron. But I couldn't get into Akron because I had to have an African-American roommate, and they didn't have one. So finally, they had a new director of education. Well, hold hold on a second. It it wasn't you that requested an African-American roommate. No, no, not me. But they did not. You have to remember, they did not enter uh, the rooms at that time. Mm -hmm. So they got... They, um, we had a new director of education come, and she said to me, yes, you can come in. And I, I think that was really great because they had cadet nursing money. That they, they were very frugal, and it was still left over, so they were able to help me with my tuition. And that's thanks to Francis Payne Bolton. It's like the wheel has come full circle that I came to Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing later to get my other degrees because she was the one that introduced the cadet nursing bill. And when she introduced the cadet nursing bill during World War II, she uh, promoted cadet nurses who are African-American. And she also said that nursing schools could not get the money unless they integrated. So that was a real plus for me to go into nursing at uh, Martins Ferry Hospital School of Nursing. And it was a three-year diploma school of nursing. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Dr. Mae Weichel. She is the former dean of the Case Western Reserve University's Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. She is a living legend in the field of nursing and gerontology, and she's one of Crane's 8 over 80. And uh, we're delighted to speak with her here today at the City Club Friday Forum. If you have a question, please text it to 330-541-5794 or tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the program. Dr. Weichel, I want to take a step back. As you tell these stories, it's uh, it's clear that you've, ta- you've talked about your journey quite a lot, and you tell the story with a certain amount of joy in your voice. However, I... I I can't, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like as a, a young woman in the 1950s 
and the only African American in a hospital that was that may not have wanted you. Uh, it, it was it was not. I won't say it was easy, but I did finally get some support. I did have a room all by myself. I did not have a roommate, but I um, was able to uh, study and learn, and and I began helping other students. Um, I, I always liked tutoring, and so I really. Um, was welcomed by finally by the other students, but I had difficulties. You know, if I I went into one uh, elderly woman's room to to take care of her, and she said, "Oh my goodness, she had an African American nurse," and she was not too pleased with that. And I I just laughed at her and said, "Well, you know, it's, I'm the only nurse that you have, so let's get started." <laughs> so I had a lot of times when they um, they really singled me out as the pioneer, Martin Ferry's pioneer. So I I had people saying, you know, they're giving you a chance. And on both sides, both African Americans and on on the other uh, white Americans would say, well, they're giving you a chance, and so you better not mess up. So it it was not easy. It's a lot of stress, but I enjoyed nursing. I enjoyed uh, taking care of patients, and I enjoyed the education that I learned about health care. In the last 60 years, the profession has changed quite a lot. Yes. Talk about that a little. Well, it's changed because I, I, at my time, you know, nurses were supposed to be subservient and to be quiet, and you didn't want to showcase what you knew because you had to pay attention to what the doctor said. You know, I came from the days when you stood up when a doctor walked into the room, um, and, and that's uh, not a negative thing about doctors. That's just the way it was. And I think some of that came from Florence Nightingale, who was hoping to get nurses recognized. And so she was very much into people being subservient and working long hours at little pay and so on so you could get nursing going. And I think it's, it's funny that today we look at Florence Nightingale, but 150 years ago, as in 1870, one of the things that she said is that she it would take 150 years before nurses would be where she envisioned that they could uh, um, practice. And so that has happened. So nursing has changed quite a bit. You know, they specialize. We have nurse practitioners. We now have nurse educators who have had research in terms of nursing. Uh, Back in my day, a lot of the lectures were given by the physicians. And now we have nurse scientists and nurse leaders and that's made a lot of difference in what nurses can do. And they can, besides just pouring medicines, they can prescribe medicines, and they can really do some of the basic health care. With this COVID epidemic, one of the things that I've thought about is that back in Florence Nightingale's day, even though she was an epidemiologist, she knew about germ theory, but she didn't know as much as we know today. But she believed in the basics, and that was you know, cleanliness and sunshine and she worked with the uh, it, during the Crimean War, and she knew about making sure it wasn't overcrowded. So it's the basic kind of things. And I think today with the COVID-19 that we don't know much about, we have to go back to the basics, and that's cleanliness, washing your hands and wearing masks and doing some of the basic things that we know about germ theory. It's been uh, tremendous. I mean, those those basic things, those two basic things, and along with don't touch your face, right, have been right. The, the, the most prevalent advice offered over the last four months. One of the uh, aspects of COVID-19 is the ways in which it has dramatically highlighted uh, disparate health outcomes for yeah. communities of color and individuals uh, in the African-American community. Um, and coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic has been also an understanding of racism as another public health crisis, another yes. kind of virus. Yes, racism is a public health crisis, and that's because we have marginalized communities in which people uh, cannot, uh, African Americans and other minorities, they can't stay home and work during the crisis. They're, they're really frontline workers. And one of the things that we know that in these communities, we do not have the public health nurses that we had uh, back in the day that would go around to homes and do public health nursing. And so there's no one there to really help teach them about um, not touching your face and washing your hands and so on. And besides, with this um, epidemic, 
there was a myth going around in the African-American community that African-Americans could not get COVID-19. And once that was entrenched, it's been very hard to convince people. I talked to a young African-American male the other day who said, well, I go to the doctor all the time and I know I won't get uh, the coronavirus. And see, they said that there, we need more education. And then the supplies, we need more masks in, in, the, in the communities, more sanitizers. You can hardly go to a store and get a, a sanitizer or uh you know, Lysol spray and so on. So we have a lot to do to help in the community for teaching uh, about um, the the infection and the control of COVID-19. These declarations uh, that are happening at, at the city government level and county government levels around the country regarding racism as a public health crisis seem to point to more than just health outcomes. They right. point to the toxic stress that communities of color are living with as a result of simply trying to survive in a country that appears to be a to, appears to have deeply intractable structural racism everywhere. Yes, I always call it the socio-economic health racial disparities that we have in this country, and it certainly has been brought to light during this epidemic. How do you? How have you? Though I mean, I, I have to imagine that in your career, both in academia and in healthcare, that you've experienced that kind of stress as a black woman. And in particular, it seems to me, and I, I believe there are research studies that, that bear this out, that black women carry very specific and very heavy burdens. Well, I, I, I think so. I, uh, it's very hard in terms of of uh, getting the education that they want, you know, in terms of having the money available for tuition and to go to school. And I was very fortunate. I got all my degrees, my bachelor's, master's, Ph.D., and so on, after I was married, and that I had to have a lot of support from my family in order to go ahead and carry out the kinds of uh, goals that I wanted to reach. And it is true because it, it's the it's the mother and the family that keeps saying, you know, you got to wash your hands and don't touch your face, and <laughs> making sure that uh, that we practice distancing. I want to um, ask you specifically about the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, and you know, as a as a nurse, as a as somebody de- devoted to health and devoted to helping people live. Um, what the language, the, the particular language that Black Lives Matter means to you and has meant to you and, and how that has changed over the last few years as that movement uh, was born and, and has evolved? Well, I, I, I'm glad to see the movement uh, grow because in the beginning it was, got a lot of negative publicity. And during this crisis, it's now getting more positive publicity that black lives do matter. And it's not that other lives don't matter as well, but black lives matter because they're the ones that are under the brunt of uh, more dying, uh, the loss of uh, economics, loss of jobs, and so on. And so I think that it's it's a good movement, and and I applaud the peaceful movements that bring into the conscience of America that black lives do matter and that uh, there's something that we can do about it. In 2002, when you spoke at the City Club, the last time you spoke at the City Club, you were dean of the nursing school. And yeah. one of the areas that you that you focused on was a coming shortage in nursing, of, of labor in nursing, of nurses, and the need to address that. How, in the end, has, have we fared with regard to, the, to providing an, an adequate supply or an inadequate supply of nurses? Well, I think our supply is much better. When I became dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, our incoming freshman class was 33. We now have an income. This year it's, it's up to 80-something, but we have been up to into the hundreds of young people coming into nursing, and we've been able to accommodate them and teach them. And so there is, I think there's been an emphasis on nursing as being a, as a, a wonderful profession for women. You know, back in Florence Nightingale's day, uh, she happened to come from the upper class, and Young women from from the upper class that was frowned on for them to go into nursing. That that it had, there was a lot of negative attitudes about becoming a nurse, and we've seen that now change. And she worked very hard to change that. 
uh, image. And because of her, nurse, the ner- image of nurses has really developed into a uh, very positive image. And so we see more young women and men coming into nursing as, as a wonderful field for them to be in. Um, back in my, I always go back and say back in my day, I can remember when uh, nurses could not complete a bath on a male patient or you couldn't do a catheterization on a male patient. And that, that now has all changed. And when men first came into nursing, they had a difficult time finding uh, patients who would accept them in, like in obstetrics. And uh, that's all changed. And so we see now more equality between men, and, and it's an okay thing for men to come into nursing as well as women. And there are all kinds of positions in nursing. You know, you can work in different fields. You can specialize. You can become a nurse practitioner. You can do nursing research. And now we're focusing a lot on leadership education. I know that's happening at the FTB School of Nursing because nurses are leaders, and they're the ones that hold the labyrinth. I said that they hold the patchwork together of, of the healthcare field. And that doesn't take away from the other healthcare professionals, but it's just that the nurse who has learned to work with patients, and I think with what hasn't changed in nursing, and this is very important, is that sensitive nurse-patient relationship, because it's that relationship in which the nurse teaches patients how to take care of themselves, as well as how to make sure that they understand their health care needs. How do you teach that? I know that's something that you've taught a lot. Well, well we teach it by having um, nurses, nursing students work with patients, and we come back and talk about that, and they talk about your relationship with the patient. And one of the problems with the COVID-19 is that nurses are working so hard and they're making sure that someone's at the bedside with the patient. And that's where that nurse-patient relationship is extremely important because they can't see their families. But the nurse helps them, you know, communicate with families. And I I think that that nurse-patient relationship will always be there. You, You call on the nurse when you need help. And so we teach that by... Uh, going over what they do and helping them to understand their own feelings about nursing because they also have to look at, at death and dying because they have, I have nurses that come on TV that say, you know, I've worked so hard with this patient on the ventilator and then lost the patient. So they have a lot of their own emotional needs to take care of as well as worrying about being away from their families or bringing the virus back to their families. But they are really devoted to their profession, and this is what we do. We're, when we're called on in a crisis, we respond. Do you find, I, I know that bedside manner is one of those things that um, right. is hard to measure, but you, you kind of know it when you when you witness it, you know it when you feel it, when you're receiving a uh, positive or good bedside manner. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that, um, that it is, in fact, something you can teach if you have a, a, a nursing student who, for whom it doesn't come naturally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's part of our nursing um, the expectations as, as an instructor is to help them understand and to teach the bedside manner because that's part of the – my background, of course, is psych nursing, psychiatric nursing, and that's what we understand is those relationships and the need to, to support patients through crisis. And through any of their health care needs. Mm-hmm. We're speaking with Dr. Mae Weichel. She's a former dean of the Case Western Reserve University School of Nursing. She's a, a, a lifelong nurse, 60 years in the profession uh, as a practitioner and also as a, an educator and leader. And if you have questions for her, you can text them to 330 541 5794. That's 330. 330- Five four one five seven nine four, or you can tweet them at the City Club, and we will work them into the program. I, I'd like to ask you about your commitment to integrate uh, nursing and to bring more minority uh, students and more more minority potential, you know, future nurses into nursing. Um, how have you been? How have you done that? And why? The, I, it's. In many ways, this question is rather obvious, but I'd still like to ask it. Why have you done it? Why has that been so important to you? Well, I think it's been important because I think when we have patients coming in, uh, particular patients of color, that they also see nurses of color. 
Uh, one of the things that impressed me when I, I did, I was at Martins Ferry Hospital School of Nursing, but we affiliated at City Hospital. And that's the first time in my life I had ever seen a black nurse, ever. And so I was really impressed. She was head of the, in those days we had a, tuber, they had a tuberculosis unit. And uh, she was the head nurse there. And I was just awe that, that they would be there. And so I think with patients coming in, the same thing. They would they do like to see some people that, that, that they say is the same color as me. <laughs> and um, so I worked hard, at, at and, and so did the faculty at FPB in making sure that we recruit minorities, that we make sure that we have minorities on the faculty, so we've had different committees to do that. And our current dean is working with, uh, she has a, a, a out um, strong together, she just, I, I'm probably not getting that right, but she just published that in terms of us working together. And that would include looking at health disparities and bringing in more minorities into nursing. I think in the beginning it was thought that minorities wouldn't be able to make good nurses, just like back in World War II they thought that African-American males wouldn't make good soldiers. But that that has all changed because they certainly have demonstrated. And we have now a an African-American who's head of the American Nurses Association. I was very fortunate to be elected the second African-American, the head of our uh, SIGMA, which is our national nursing International Nursing Honor Society. So we're beginning to see more African Americans in leadership roles and taking leadership courses. And both the Surgeon General and the um, and the Chief Nurse of the United States are African American as well. Right. Um, the it it's such a it is both such a a, a long distance from the what you describe in the early parts of your career to today, but it's also so recent. Right. And we still need to be, and, and African Americans coming in, many of them that want to come in do not have the resources, and so that we have to have uh, um, scholarships for them and, and more support for underrepresented. One of the things I do at the FDB School of Nursing is I still head up the, uh, we have a, a, a group in um, development that's trying to bring in more money for underrepresented uh, students that come in. And so those are the kinds of things that we try to deliberately recruit more African Americans into nursing. Healthcare has gone through some tremendous changes over those those six decades in which you've worked. And um, it doesn't always seem to me that while certain things have improved, it doesn't seem to me that overall um, we're, we've created a better system for everybody. And I wonder how you see it, but sort of more importantly to that is what you would change? Well, I think that we see more uh, uh, African-Americans in the health professions, uh, in, the, in the physicians, too. I had only known one African-American physician before I came to City Hospital back in those days, so that you do see that you were getting more people in. And But there is still the, the racism that still exists, that we still... Um, Sometimes you walk into a restaurant and you think, gee, you know, should I be here? And you look around to see, are there any people in here like me besides people who are working in the kitchen and washing dishes and so on? So that we've, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go before that people really feel equal and that they're not, uh, particularly with African Americans coming in as patients, that they often look to see who's taking care of them and do they understand the, their culture. One of the the great concerns has to do with in in the situation you just described is that people who are providing care often aren't aware of any implicit biases or structural racism that may be at play and may make assumptions that result in in somebody not receiving the care they deserve. And that does happen, but that's one of the things that we do in in our in teaching is that we help nurses understand uh, racial disparities, uh, health disparities among races and to help them understand the different cultures. We do focus on that, all the cultures, so that they have some understanding of what they bring to the bedside. 
Dr. May Weichel is Professor Emerita at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. She's one of Crane's Cleveland businesses, eight, over, eight in their 80s. And uh, we are turning now to your questions. You can text your questions to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can tweet them at the City Club. This is the City Club Friday Forum. I'm Dan Malthrop. And uh, to these questions... Uh, would you speak briefly about the contributions made by immigrant nurses? Oh, I, they, they've made great contributions to this country. One of the things that we had at, at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing was a focus on international mm-hmm. and uh, our WHO. And so we had many students coming from um, Thailand and Taiwan and um, some of the other countries coming in and we find that that's, it's a delight to mix cultures and to teach nursing. And I've also been privileged to have the experience of going to schools of nursing and colleges in places like Japan and Taiwan and Thailand to work with students. And we have many of our students that, after they're at CASE, go back home and become deans and are able then to uh, promote uh, good quality and competent health care. So I love international students. Here's another question for you from our listening audience. Despite the emphasis on nurses during the COVID crisis, it's disheartening that several nurses are lo- many nurses are losing their jobs and being laid off due to low hospital census numbers. What advice do you have for nurses who are losing their jobs? And for those who aren't aware that hospitals are have been cutting jobs, could you explain why? Well, I think that there are going to need to bring them back because particularly since we don't know enough about this crisis and whether it's going to go away it's not going to magically go away and so we do need the nurses so there are other jobs that they they'll have to look for until hospitals are able to hire them back again because there's other nursing besides the hospital nursing Um, i like the whole idea of, of revising public health nursing that we need more nurses in the community uh, and that's one of the things that you'll see is that nurse practitioners uh, in drug stores and that you can go there for some of your health care. I think that takes the place of the public health nurse who's, who's walking the streets and covering a certain area that they have. And I think that um, nurses can do that. So I, I know it it's, um, provides a lot of anxiety when you lose your job, but as a nurse, nurses are always able to find work. And so I'm very... Um, positive about that. I know you, you, your last class that you taught at Case Western Reserve was, uh, became an online class uh, halfway yes. through the semester. Um, so oh, congrats on, oh, we're just going to yes. pause for a second while she <laughs> takes care of that. Dr. Weichel, let me know when you're back with us. We're listening, we're with Dr. May Weichel, Professor Emerita at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. As I said, it's a City Club Friday Forum, and you can text your questions to 330-541-5794. We're kind of celebrating nursing today uh, in honor of wor- the World Health Assembly's declaration that 2020 is the year of the nurse and the midwife. Um, and Dr. May Weichel is uh, with us today. Um, Dr. Weichel, I... Yeah. there you are. Great. Great to have you back. I'm glad you're, <laughs> I'm glad you're with us. The... Um, let me go to uh, to another question here. As nurses, how do we get health systems to acknowledge the nurse the nursing leadership role, its importance, and to compensate it appropriately? I'm re- and and in asking this question too, I mean, we we're talking earlier about a nursing shortage, and whenever professions are spoke about as there being a shortage with nurses or with teachers. I'm always reminded of the fact that we never seem to have a shortage of financial advisors or or bankers or stockbrokers. We never have a a shortage of of lawyers because these professions all sort of pay enough to attract people. Well, I we're doing better with salaries and with and 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 compensation. Um, for, with someone we I talked once at a meeting and this young this nurse said you know it's because of Florence Nightingale that nurses started out at low pay because she had enough money of her own, so she didn't take much money from her work. And um, so they didn't want to give nurses more money than she was getting. That's really the 
the, the humor in talking about Florence Nightingale. The nurses now are really compensated. They have leadership positions. We're seeing more nurses on boards, more nurses helping to make policy, and certainly more nurses in charge of the health care system. Could you imagine a nurse becoming CEO of a major hospital? Absolutely. Do you think yeah. do you think the current the the boards of hospitals are with you on that? I think so. I think and there are some CEOs of hospitals. Well, that's so or at least you know parts of hospitals have nurses as a CEO. Um the uh, another question having to do with telehealth and related to the question about nurses losing their jobs, we're seeing a great push into telemedicine right now. What kind of opportunities are there, and is this included as a, a part of nursing education today? Well, yes. You know, you have uh, hospitals now that have ask a nurse. You have a question, you can call in and ask. And so that um, uh, some of the research that nurses are doing has to do with telehealth. I remember when I um, being on the faculty when we were putting computers in the homes of um, patients, and particularly the health caregivers. And they had computers that they could call in and they could ask the nurse uh, what to do or, or to help them make a decision. So I, that's it's very modern. And once you get used to learning how to use Zoom, <laughs> I think it's something that nurses certainly can do very well. Dr. Weichel, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, so please make sure that your phone is, is closer to your mouth if you can. Yeah. Um, I, another question for you. Um, uh, you mentioned you mentioned Florence Nightingale a few times, and uh, the listener would love to hear f- about which other nurses have impacted you, both uh, as you became a nurse and and in your journey. Well, I've had several nurses. Um, one nurse uh, when I worked at Cleveland Psychiatric Institute when I was uh, doing psychiatric nursing uh, was the director of nursing. She was a very fair and kind person who supported me in going back to school to get my bachelor's degree. Her name was Joan Wilder. And then when I came to Case, I had a number of mentors. Jim Watts was a mentor of mine, Rosella Schlossfeld. And uh, so I've always been able to find someone who is, a, I, I think every nurse needs a mentor. And uh, someone that they can go back to, they can talk about their issues and concerns, and someone who, who gives them that kind of support. As I said, we're talking with Dr. Mae Weichel, uh, Professor Emerita and former dean at Case Western Reserve University's Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. Um, and if you have a question, text it to 330-541-5794 or tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the forum today. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Weichel, um, advice, one piece of advice that you would like to see in promoting the future of nursing. What would that be? Um, one piece of advice? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I, my advice to nurses happens to be is that you need to look at your career and you need to plan where you want to be, where you want to go. That one of the things about nursing is that you're able to change your um positions and um, decide on what clinical area you want to be in. And I think that nurses need to set goals. They need to set goals for being the CEO of hospitals and to being on boards and being policy makers and also to learn more about leadership and how that they are so important as leaders in the healthcare system. Okay. okay. Next question for you. What do you think about, where do you see the the field going? What do you see in the future of nursing? Do you see greater convergence of nursing and medicine in the days ahead? Well, I don't think that nursing and medicine will converge because medicine is an entirely different profession. And I think for such a long time, nurses were felt to be under physicians and that they uh, uh, didn't do things on their own. And that's not true anymore. Nursing is really developed and we have, as I said, we have decision makers in nursing and they can, um, they're in hospitals and they're pulling everything together. So I think that the future of nursing is great. It keeps expanding. And like um, Florence Nightingale envisioned where we would be uh, 150 years from 1870, that, that we really are there today and that we are developing more and nurses are being much more respected. As a matter of fact, for the last 16 years, 
nurses have been uh, selected to be the most honest, the most kindest uh, uh, of the professionals. And so we're really very proud of that as well. Another question for you, Dr. Weichel. Throughout the country, advanced practice nurse practitioners, those with advanced degrees and clinical expertise, have found that federal, state, and local policies sometimes limit them practicing to the full scope of their abilities. Yes. How do we change policy so nurse practitioners can serve the public more than they're currently allowed? Well, we petition the state boards and, and, and we look at the laws, and that's why it's important to be involved in policy making so that you can see that nurses need to practice to their full scope. And so I think that's coming along. It's taken a while. Um, and, and I think with the movement to nurse practitioners that, it, that we have been able to push for more uh, practice that, that, that relates to our scope. Again, talking now today here at the City Club Friday Forum with Dr. Mae Weichel. She's Professor Emerita and former Dean at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. Today we're celebrating the Year of the Nurse and Midwife, which is, of course, all the more important uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic, although this year was named such uh, long before the coronavirus became uh, the the most widely known virus uh, on the planet. Another question for you, Doctor. Healthcare and Cleveland has certainly changed a lot in the last 60 years since you've been a nurse. Many community hospitals have closed. You mentioned to me that the hospital where you got your start closed just before the pandemic began. And private practice physicians are practically non-existent. What do you think about these changes? Are there benefits to to these changes? And, And what are they and what are the drawbacks as well? Well, I think sometimes that pendulum swings too far one way and then it begins to come back because you will see that what the need is in health care. And so we have to constantly assess that need, for, in particular for um, marginalized communities. And so I, I really do think that we're going to be much more involved in health care and that um, people will begin to recognize how important nursing is. Um, another question for you, uh, with the, such a long career in nursing and uh, your passion for it still evident, um, how do you reflect on burnout, which is an issue in the profession and probably a very prevalent issue today, given the, um, given the pandemic and the extreme risks that nurses are subjecting themselves to just to do their work? What advice do you have for current nurses and those considering the profession? Well, part of my research... When I was working with Dr. Marie Howes, who was another one of my mentors and taking care and learning about older people, and that is that self-care. I mean, you have to understand what your needs are before you can... I had a professor who said, you have to fill your own bucket before you can fill someone else's bucket. So nurses have to learn how to care for themselves, and that will uh, help them in terms of looking at burnout. You know, when, when they... when I really believe in mental health days, although I'm sure that uh, hospitals uh, might not like that. But I think there's a time when nurses have to step back. They have to do their vacations. They have to look at at the time they have for themselves and for their families. And that's how we handle burnout. You just can't keep going and going. They're not energizer bunnies. Given that, uh, a follow-up question has to do with the, the ways in which the healthcare profession and public health guidelines that you illuminated and pointed to earlier, uh, masking, washing your hands, not touching your face, and so forth. So much of it has become politicized today, which I think must be difficult if you're in the profession to hear. It is, it is difficult. That's why I say that since we don't know enough about the, the, the coronavirus, we have to go back to some of the basics. And some of the basics happens to be washing your hands, not touching your face, and wearing a mask. And they've politicized wearing a mask, which doesn't make sense because it doesn't go against your individual rights. It supports your individual rights, your right to be healthy and to, and to keep others from, from getting the, it from the spread of the germ. Um, we don't complain because you can't drive a car without a license. I don't care about your individual rights. You have to have a license. And I see masks as the same thing. Masks do help, and they do help prevent the spread of disease. That's why years ago, when you, or even today, when you go into surgery, you go in with a mask on. 
and so that uh, I don't think it should be politicized as much as it's being done today. Dr. Weichel, this year is, in addition to being the year of the nurse, it's also the International Year of the Midwife. Um, yeah. Can you talk about the importance of midwives, especially in the black community, where black maternal and infant mortality rates are so troubling? Well, I think midwives make a difference. And that's why uh, I, like the public health nurse, we used to make visits for mothers who were expecting. And we still do that today. We have physicians and nurses going together into homes to, to work with uh, pregnant mothers, uh, particularly in underserved communities. But I think the year of the midwife is important because in underdeveloped countries and all over the w- world, we have midwives who are delivering babies and taking care of the maternal health of um women. And so I, I, I love it that they added the midwives because that is somewhere where nurses have advanced and that we have are getting better recognition to midwives and the job that they do and helping to bring in healthy babies and working with mothers to keep babies healthy. We're speaking with Dr. Mae Weichel of Case Western Reserve University, where she's Professor Emerita, and uh, she is also the former dean of Case Western Reserve University's Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. It's the year of the nurse and the midwife, as declared by the World Health Assembly. Um, I wonder about the impact of COVID-19 on the application rates to nursing schools. In some fashion, they um, this might seem like more attention is being drawn to nursing as a profession, and yet it has never seemed riskier. Well, it, it, it is riskier, but we still have ways of, of uh, masking and uh, hand, you know, hand washing and the hand sanitizers is, is protection. We do teach our nursing students safety measures so that um, that shouldn't prevent them from coming in. One of the concerns that we have, of course, is that making sure that um, we're able to do distancing and so on. So it's changing the way nursing education at the present is being delivered, and that's why we have the virtual classrooms and some online teaching so that nursing students um, do not need to fear um, contamination. This uh, other note from a listener about the bill for limited honorary veteran status for nurses uh, from World War II. No money, no no veterans benefits, and no burial at Arlington Cemetery, but just a gratitude plaque and an American flag. Is there any way to get this passed in the year of the nurse? Uh, the listener writes, we need more senators, particularly Republicans, to get this passed before these women of the greatest generation are all gone. This is House Resolution uh, 2056. Right. I think we just have to push for it. That's why we need nurses in leadership positions to be able to say this is something that they deserve because the World War II would have been in great trouble if they didn't have the nurses. And that's why Frances Payne Bolton supported the cadet nurses. And she um, provided um, tuition for them and uniforms for them so that they could could help in, in the war. And she was also uh, instrumental in, in the cadet nurses for African Americans. And so we need we do owe them a debt of gratitude. And we're beginning to see uh, recognition given to like the Tuskegee Airmen. And I think that the nurses in World War Two who did a tremendous job of helping with our wounded soldiers and so on. So, yes, I, I, I hope to see the day when they get that kind of recognition. Dr. Weichel, as we get close to the end of our hour with you, I, I wonder how optimistic you are about the future of health care and the ability of healthcare institutions and the sector broadly to handle the challenges of that are that we're facing, not just the COVID pandemic, but the pandemic of racism, as we've discussed. Well, I think that we're now at a good talking uh, place for to talk about racism. That this uh, latest protest of Black Lives Matter has brought to the forefront some of the issues in the um, African American community, and I, I I really am optimistic about continuing the dialogue. You see, sometimes we have these little peaks that we uh, say we're interested in things and then it goes away, and I hope it does continue. Because for a patient coming into a hospital, and particularly if you're an African-American patient, you wonder about what kind of care you're going to get, simply because of the history 
of African Americans not being able to come in the front door of the hospitals and the clinics were always in the back and they really felt that they were getting secondary care and they were very suspicious of uh, hospitals and some of their recommendations and so we're, we're trying to stamp some of that out through education but we also have to educate the practitioners to understand what their feelings are and, and how they can understand what kind of uh, treatment they're getting even if it's not from someone of their same color as they are. It does, it does seem as if we need to shift the model entirely to be more proactive and to think about you know, not just the the sort of symptoms and, and, and pathology diagnosis, but to think about the underlying toxic stress that many patients are, are and, and many people who aren't even seeking health care right now will right. be undergoing and, and living with. And I think it's important, too, to have more um, providers of color or for uh, different races that... Um, so the patients can have more confidence. I can remember when I was a, a nursing student and I was taking care of a young a white patient who was, uh, he was just adorable, he'd had an appendectomy. And he, he kept looking at me and looking at me and finally he said to me, nurse, if you wash and wash and wash and wash and wash and wash and wash, would you be the same color as me? So you know, see there are some misconceptions about color and um, that some of the negative attitudes about people of color. That certainly was uh, something that I, that I experienced when I was back in the day going through nursing school. You know, and with respect to this, um, this issue of the toxic stress, uh, we've had Dr. Nadine Burke Harris speak at the City Club and mm-hmm. about the impact of toxic stress on children and, um, and as children age and you know become adults, the the long term effects of that stress, and these adverse childhood experiences, and there's a lot of, as you know, a lot of research about them. Has this become part of the nursing curriculum as well? Oh yes, it's part of the nursing curriculum. We do talk about culture. We talk about children, and particularly since we focus a lot on on pediatrics and working with the, with the child. Um, and that's one of the things that children, when they're born, are not racist. It's one of the things that they learn that, you know, am I different from someone else? And, uh, and it, it really sometimes is shocking. Um, I remember with my own children trying to help them understand uh, why they were uh, uh, African Americans and what the difference was, because they didn't understand that at all until they got older. And... Uh, so you, you do have to talk to them. You have to talk to children and, and help them to understand. Children right now, some of them are very afraid because they're afraid that they're going to be shot by a policeman or is it okay for me to go into that building? And and so uh, parents have to do a lot of talking to children about who they are and raising their self-concept so, so that they know that it's okay just because you're of a different color doesn't mean that you aren't competent and able and willing to learn. Dr. Mae Weichel is an author. She's one of Crane's Cleveland businesses, eight in their 80s. She received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Black Nurses Association and so formerly of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health, appointed there by former Governor Bob Taft. And she is currently still Professor Emerita at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University, where she was also dean for many, many years. Dr. May Weichel, I want to thank you so much for being a part of our program today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And I want to thank you as well for joining us for our forum today with Dr. May Weichel. Our forum is presented in collaboration with the Northeast Ohio Year of the Nurse Steering Committee. It's also part of our Healthcare Innovation Series sponsored by Medical Mutual and the Metro Health System. Community partners today are the Better Health Partnership and the Marion K. Shaughnessy Nurse Leadership Academy at Case Western Reserve University's Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. We appreciate their support of City Club programming. City Club virtual forums are sponsored by the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, Key Bank, Nordson, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and PNC, along with many more generous members, sponsors, and donors listed on our website at cityclub.org slash thank you. You can join them in supporting our work when you make a contribution online or you become a member at cityclub.org. 
We're going to continue to present our forums online and over the airwaves throughout this time, either uh, virtually, as I said, or here from the IdeaStream studios. Next Friday, July 3rd, WCPN will be rebroadcasting one of our City Club youth forums on disparities in youth mental health care. And then we'll be back on July 10th with some new forums for you. If you have ideas about topics or speakers we should feature while we're sheltering in place and continuing to socially distance, please get in touch. We're at cityclub.org. I'm Dan Malthrop. Stay strong, stay healthy, and stay close in your hearts if you can't be close in person. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.